Hey guys, this is Ryan from AMS. Let's see who we bumped into at Rockville today in Daytona Beach, Florida. All right, we're here with Trey from Mr. Bungle. I guess let's start with the name. Who is Mr. Bungle? Well, the name came from uh, when we first encountered it on Pee Wee's Playhouse, where he was playing a 50s uh, etiquette film. The etiquette film teaches young kids how what not to do, how uh -huh. not to be. And of course, you know, being the angst-ridden children that we were when we started the band, we thought that was a, gr a great band name. And it stuck. It stuck. Any it other stuck. names that were uh, that didn't make the cut? Indeed, there was the the name Summer Breeze. Ooh, we the, were like serious. the Seals and Croft song, or Seals and Croft, which we play. Okay, right, of course. These, these days we're playing it. The name Summer Breeze had a big upside down cross going right through the middle of it, mm -hmm, as it should. It was a little ahead of its time. Like for, in 1984, that or five or whatever, yeah. you know, might not have been as good as it would be now. So it's a big part of what you guys do. It's like obviously you're serious musicians. You know what you're doing, but. You want people to kind of get the joke, right? Like, you know, we're going to come out, we're going to do a Nestle Toll House commercial as a song, and then we're going to play, you know, the heaviest thing you've ever heard. Like, what are the rules? Or well, are there any? The Nestle Toll House song has the same chord progression as Stairway to Heaven mm -hmm. and countless other songs. So it already is the heaviest song in the world. Never thought of it that way. Yeah. that's. I mean, that, we're just here to point things like that out. Stuff that was right in front of us the whole time, and yeah. then it's like, well, there you go. You're welcome. We get credit for being geniuses for unearthing these things that are right under everybody's noses. Well, let's not tell anybody. You guys are geniuses. We'll leave it at that. Well, I mean, yeah. Can we erase all of this stuff? And Absolutely. Go back? Yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll fix it in post. So when you guys are going to do a show, it's like, all right, we're going to put the set list together. H how does one even possibly do that? Uh, is it up to you? Are you the MD? Who does it? Actually, Trevor recently has been doing it all of the time, and, um, you know, it's... It's not as hard as you might think. We only have, I think, 50 songs to choose from at this oh, point. Oh, that's it, yeah. But back in the day, it was more like, you know, 150 or something. Okay. It's easier now. So if you're like, a, like if the, if Mike got a hair up his ass and said, I, I don't want to do this song, I'm just going to go into something else, you got to be ready to go? Or is it pretty, you guys are pretty much on the same page? At, at this point, with this configuration, we're pretty, it's more of a... It's more predictable. Okay. In the '90s, we were more spontaneous. You know, we had to, we had to be ready. Oh yeah. 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 I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't think if a lot of people out here who are watching this kind of check out Mr. Bungle, and there's not one like you couldn't point to one song and go, "All right, that's us." No. Yeah. No. And that's. But here's the thing: that th there's a lot of talk about how like we would change genre. Right. You know. But if you listen to our music, it's. It doesn't really, there's a couple cases where it changes genre in the song, but the whole song isn't in a genre. You know, it's more like, it's not really genre shifting. It's, mm -hmm. th these compositions are kind of unto themselves. That's, that's the way I, we always looked at it is they're not, genre is sort of not the right concept. Yeah, I guess so. you don't want to be defined by one thing or another. Like you could play a festival like this and then you could go like, you do like a death polka and, and still be happy, you know? Yeah, that's exactly right. Back, back in those days, we weren't playing like, like heavy ass festivals like right. this, but that's probably just because everybody hated us. <laughs> we finally got invited on a couple of them right before the band like took a twenty year hiatus, right? And that was when because new metal became a thing. Sure. Which that wasn't really we weren't really part of new metal. We were like old metal. But you could probably hear some of the elements of what you guys were pushing back. Of I mean, you influenced so many of those bands that were big in new metal and. You know, yeah, so it's like it's hard to shy away from it, but at the same time, it's like that's really not what we do. It was it was a little awkward and right. weird, but we very much appreciated being asked along for the ride. Sure, but it's what killed the band. Really, that's what did it. No, that's oh, I was gonna get a little serious here for a no, minute. No, no, we we're good at killing ourselves. Oh, we should do behind the music. I think that would be a good episode. Wait till the band is dead and buried. And All right, we'll fair do enough. It. Um, so now we got we got Dave from Slayer in here and Scott. You know, so we're bringing in obviously a little bit more of that old school metal yes. feel. Yes. Um, not that they can't play other things because they can. When I hear you play, I mean, I, I'm hearing like a million different things coming around at once. Like, what would be some of your surprising influences? Like, if someone said, I have no idea this guy listened to Keith Urban or something. I mean, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I listen to, um, I like uh, Azerbaijani music, Alim Kazimov. Like, right. uh, I like, um, well, Trevor and I both listen to a lot of 20th century classical music. Okay. Like the more dissonant kind of, the composers like uh, Georgi Ligeti. Christoph Pendereski, Yanis Zinakis. That that's like that was in our bag of of tricks in the early days, and I think that we've carried all the way 
until this moment. So, like, if you're not playing guitar, what, what, what's, like, an instrument you would probably pick up and just rock around the house on, like an oud or, like, a bazooki or... I'll tell you, before Schechter started giving me guitars, yeah. I had one functioning guitar, like one functioning normal guitar. Okay. Mostly what I play is, yeah, exactly, uh, baglama, saz, okay. oud. Um, when it comes to the stringed instruments, it's that and keyboards. Now, but this this gig has demanded that I pick up the guitar and be serious about it got again. It. So it's like, I kind of, I got serious for the first time in 25 years, maybe 30 years about playing guitar again. Thanks to Schechter. I'm not just blowing smoke. Well, we love the guys at Schechter. They're good. They're good friends of ours. I mean that that yeah. thing, the the guitar that I bought, the first guitar uh, Schechter guitar that I bought, like, it's like, oh, that that's why everybody can shred. Yeah, they're so easy to play. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know? well, do you remember your first guitar? It was like, I remember mine. And, and like, I, you pick up a guitar now and Schechter makes a guitar. It could be $600, which is not that much now. And you yeah. could you could gig with it. I mean, you could rip on it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's it's, it's very different. It, I, well, I was lucky. I had a GNL F100. Oh, all right. That's a badass that's guitar. A good guitar. You I'm still sorry. have it? I do still have it. Does it stay at home? It's not in good shape. No? Not in good shape. So when you play those other instruments, do you find that, that some of those elements come out in how you play guitar as well? I assume. Are you in standard tuning? Uh, for this, yeah, we, yeah. We, we're, we're down in E flat, but it's all. Standard. But I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, nothing too wacky. Stuff I do in my other band, Secret Chiefs, is all. It's not even in Western tuning. It's it's in microtonal tunings and stuff. And do you have like the tempered frets and stuff like that on those? Yeah. Okay. And was, that doesn't mess with your head. No, I mean, I've I've uh, I came up with with a, a system that's pretty simple actually. Okay. Oh, all right. And that was a long ass time ago, so I'm very comfortable with it now. And so with what you're doing with Bungle. Um, how do you divvy it up with Scott? What do you, do you just go? You want to play that? I'll play this, or is it? It was, you know, this demo, the the music that we're playing from this demo. It was. And this is the Wrath of the Easter Money. The Raging Wrath of the Easter yeah. Bunny. So okay. it's, it's all guitar music, and you know, all the real metal bands that we were listening to: Anthrax, Slayer, you know, Metallica. Sure. Or even going back to like Judas Priest, Merciful Fate. It's all two guitars. Right. We only had one guitar player, and then we switched and stopped doing metal. So now we're going back and revisiting this metal we were doing in 1986. Like, well, we need we need the other guitar player. Right. So we got Scott. I mean, Scott was who was inspiring us in a large way to begin with. Sure. He's a machine. It's ridiculous. And he, you know, the, the amazing thing, I'll just say this, because we think that we thought until recently that the, the riffs and all the stuff that we made up was like, yeah, this is what, this is what Exodus does, this is right. what all the bands do. But we've like realized like no, <laughs> these riffs are really weird, <laughs> really hard, really fucked up. Yeah. And, and um, man, Scott dug in like he he learned it. I can't believe he set all of the time and effort aside. That must have been like all right. Dude, he did his homework. He wasn't just gonna come in and he doesn't yeah. phone it in on yeah. any gig he does. But right. the fact no. that he, he like carried so much for every tiny little detail, mm -hmm. it's just like it's amazing, amazing. Did Couldn't it make you want to cry a little bit? Or? I've, I've cried many times about it. That's that's Dave really nice. Too. I always cry about these guys. See, that would be like a dream for, I mean, any musician, like especially if you're, even if metal is just one thing you listen to, to, to turn around and go, oh, there's Scott Ian and, and Dave Lombardo. I do it at least like, like three times a show. I'm like, okay, you know, because you'll feel this ferocious energy coming from the drums, you know. He's a madman. Yeah, like by the third song, yeah. it's, it's seriously like the, the gear shifts. He, yeah, he gets warmed up and pretty soon, doesn't matter what our set list is, it's like song three, it's, it's on. You're on stun. And then I look over there and it's like, holy sh**, it's Dave Lombard. Like, <laughs> I then, know. And then I'm in. And then from that point, it's like there's real energy in the band. So then after this many years, it makes, I mean, it's a cliche as it is. You still feel like a kid in some regards. After the third song. Yeah, uh, the first two songs, I'm you feel like an old man. Old man yeah. before that. Like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. How are we going to And it's something, it's, it's him. It's like his electricity like takes over. And pretty soon I don't feel anything until after the show. All right, so you got an hour to, to do the set. So what do you, I mean, do you find that it just blows right by? Or are you just like, well, I mean, we could have played, like by the third song, you almost feel like we could do a, a, another three hours. I do get that. I get to that point after like maybe the fourth show on a tour or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Right about at that point now. So when you see some of these other bands, that maybe younger bands or 90s bands, or, do, you, do you ever catch any of the other stages and go, hey, man, I did that? Do you ever feel like they kind of ripped you guys off in any way? Or? No, I mean, all of the bands that did, rip us off like they should they should have ripped us off because we were never going to revisit that material ever again or that approach ever again it's no insult to, to rip off stuff that we're well, not, we all do it we're I not going to circle around on that and be like you know oh, be no. provincial about it 
Uh, yeah, so take it. How was the, what was the, the, the impetus to go back around and, and revisit the early stuff and go, hey, we should be doing that? Was that just Mike or? No, no, it was, uh, um, it was the fact that this music has never really gotten the, its due. Right. We believe in it. And it's the essence of the band. It's the beginning of the band. Mm-hmm. And the fans didn't really know that. Like they kind of, some of the really nerdy ones knew mm-hmm. that. But sure. most people identify Mr. Bungle very differently than what our actual soul as a band is, which is this this. I was going to ask, where is now. the soul? Yeah. I mean, it, for us, it's, I've said this before, but it's like, uh, I mean, the boomers, when they go back to their roots, they're like going to play 12 bar blues and play some like sure. Bob Dylan songs. For us, we're playing, you know, Black Magic by Slayer, you know? <laughs> yeah. So this for us is our, this is our roots, you know, yeah. it's our roots music. All right. And uh, so we'll, we'll give one last shout out to Schachter. What are you using for the, for these shows? What, uh, which well, model? It's a, I, it's two different C ones. Okay. Uh, one of them is a Evil Twin. Yep. And one of them, I think, Apocalypse. Yes. That's the one I actually play. The, it's better for riffs. I like the, the Evil Twin for soloing, but oh. I can't like switch between riffs and solo in the middle of a song. So mm-hmm. I play the Apocalypse because it's. Does it have a Sustaniac and all the wacky stuff in it? Oh yeah. Dude, that's a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. I, I absolutely love both guitars. I love like they're. Um, I can't think of anything better for playing like, like fast riffs. Yeah, it's, it's what it's built for. Yeah, it's like just driving a fast car. Yeah, totally. It's so great. That's yeah. awesome. And what's in the rest of the rig? Are you guys using Fractal? Or are you using? Are you going like Kemper? Or is it all amps? No, we just switched to uh, quad core DSP. Thing. How do you like it? I love it. Yeah. Because here's the deal. Like I had the, the pedal board with the MIDI looper pedals because I have all this like. You know, I do a bunch of different kind of tones on this on this gig, even. Sure. And um, with the EVHs and everything, and it's I, I will say that the tone is that there's a small tonal sacrifice, mm-hmm. just a tiny one. Okay. But what I mean, it makes up for it in a million places. Not just the ease of setting up, but in the predictability, the, the being able to dial. Like I can fine tune. Like go through a tour and like, okay, this delete should be a little bit longer on this part. Right. I can dial this reverb back a little bit. Like try doing that on your pedals. Like yeah, you know, it's, in real time, especially. It's for 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 dialing in a live show. Right. It's really great, and it's actually I think it's very important to be able to sculpt it as you go. Right. You know, so it's I love I love the quad core DSP thing a lot. So you got everything locked in. You're ready to go. You even know by song all the different scenes and everything. I keep it simple. I have yeah. like maybe eight settings that I, you know, and I have, I have a few other pedals. I have a tensor pedal that I use to go oh, yeah. yep. crazy that's, with. Well, that's know. wild. Yeah. Yeah. And any other bands you're going to be checking out, you know, before or after the show, or is it just all business back to the bus? Pretty and... much all business. Yeah. I, I mean, we just got invited to go to the, to see Limp Biscuit, and I, right. I, I know their, uh, their tech really well. Yeah. Cadaver. Yeah. 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 I love him. Yeah. So he seems like a good dude. He's a good guy. He's and he's king. got one hell of a sundress on today. So. He's a handsome devil. He really is. Yeah. I don't think I could rock that look. I mean, it's also the name. You hear the word cadaver and you, you have low expectations. And that's his real name, right? It's uh, Cadaver his... uh, Jones. Yeah, Cadaver yeah. Jones. Jones. Yeah. That's another band name right there. You can have that. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> You're welcome. Anytime. I appreciate you coming out. Oh, this has been worth it. Cadaver yeah. Jones. Dude, that's it. I mean, if, if nothing else. Yeah. You've got that. Yeah, I got that. And we'll even give you a ride back. And then you're not going to leave I, me out here by the Inferno stage? We could do that. I mean, it's up to you guys. Whatever you want to do. Walk around. Make some friends. I told you, I like hell. You, well, you found it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. For more content like this, be sure to check us out at AmericanMusical.com. Music